Hello? Oh, you can hear me, Terry? Cindy, is that you? I'm on and everyone can hear us. So I will go ahead and um, it's a 12 after 11. So thank you for those who have already joined. Uh, we're gonna take a few more minutes to allow participants to, to join the webinar.
Good morning. This is Cindy Groniver from Cancer Bridge, and it's almost time to start. We're going to give a couple more minutes for others, uh, so others can join, and then we'll be uh, then we'll go ahead and start with our webinar uh, with Dr. Daryl Gray. Thank you. Okay, um, this is Cindy Groniger again from Cancer Bridge. And um, there is some noise in the background. I'm not sure who that is, but if you could mute your phone, that would be appreciated. So thanks everyone for joining us today. In recognition of National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, Dr. Daryl Gray will address issues related to colon cancer prevention and screening and health disparities. For your convenience, Dr. Gray has provided today's presentation, uh, and this is already uploaded in the handout section on the webinar. Before introducing Dr. Gray, though, I would like to take a few minutes to remind you of the Cancer Bridge services provided by your employer. So Cancer Bridge is a cancer-focused navigation service that provides you or your family members with immediate, one-on-one, -on -one personalized access to oncology nurses and physicians to help answer questions about your specific type of cancer. In essence, we provide immediate expert information and guidance at a time of uncertainty. Calling Cancer Bridge is a very simple process. You you call our toll-free number, which is 855-366-7700. Your call is answered immediately by an oncology nurse who will triage the call, answering your questions on your cancer, and provide you the opportunity to speak to an expert and or connect you to the right resource. Once you have had a call with the specialist, the oncology nurse will follow up to make sure all of your questions were answered and help you to continue to navigate through the cancer landscape. Cancer Bridge provides you and your family members with someone knowledgeable who will listen, rapid access to an expert in your specific cancer in order to gain additional information, an avenue that helps attain a broader understanding about your cancer and guidance on next steps in avoiding mistakes navigating you through the healthcare system as well as providing immediate answers during a time of crisis. Cancer Bridge is not only for you as an employee, but also includes your immediate family members. All those eligible include your parents, parents-in-law, spouses, partners, children, and siblings. When calling Cancer Bridge, please have the employee identification number available. Some important facts to think about on why a typical general practitioner or oncologist cannot provide the Cancer Bridge service is that our research shows that there are over 200 types of cancer and that number continues to grow. Community doctors are typically generalists with a basic knowledge of the most common cancers and don't have easy access to expertise like Dr. Gray. Our cancer experts are each invested in one particular cancer type. They know all of the presentations and the latest best treatment for the cancer. 
They evaluate and treat only patients with that cancer and advise the community oncologists on that cancer. So more importantly, they perform and publish research lecture around the world, which enables them to teach medical students, residents, and fellows on their specific cancer. Our experts know and network with other experts across the world who specialize in the same type of cancer. To learn more about Cancer Bridge, please visit our website or speak to your human resources department. So throughout the webinar, if you have any questions for our Q&A session, you can ask them through the questions panel and go to webinar. If you think of questions once the Q&A is over, please email them to questions at mycancerbridge.com and we will get those answers for you. A recording of the webinar will be posted to YouTube and the Cancer Bridge website in the next few days. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and change, uh, make Dr. Gray our presenter. And while I'm doing that, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Daryl Gray. Dr. Gray is a gastroenterologist and deputy director at the Center for uh, Cancer Health Equity at Ohio State's Comprehensive Cancer Center, James Cancer Hospital, and Solov Research Institute. Dr. Gray's presentation will take the stigma out of colorectal cancer screening, and he will discuss colon cancer health disparities. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gray. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to join you on Cancer Bridge today and um, a pleasure to talk about something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, and it's an area of ongoing research, an area of ongoing community engagement. So, so thank you uh, very much, uh, Cancer Bridge, for the opportunity to share. And one caveat I'd like to give, there may be a little background noise, and I apologize for that. I'm in my office, and occasionally if there's an ambulance that goes by, you may hear a little uh, sirens in the background. So uh, please forgive me if you hear that during our presentation. What I hope to do today um, is to provide you with a basic overview of colorectal cancer and the disparities in outcomes in colorectal cancer. Uh, review some of pre the evidence-based prevention strategies and highlight some practices with the intent that these are things that my hope is that you can adapt to your environment, whether it be community or practice, uh, even in the employer environment. I'd like to start out first telling you a little bit more about myself. So uh, not only am I a physician and researcher, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, but I'm also a father. I have uh, I've been married now for about seven years, uh, going getting closer to my eight-year anniversary, and I have two children, uh, two girls, a three-year-old uh, Harper and a 17-month-old Ella. And um, those of you who are parents know that uh, story time can be a very cherished time with your kids. And one of my favorite books, and and I say my favorite books, is probably one of more of my favorite book than my kids' favorite book, is what to what do you do with the problem. And I really enjoy this book because it talks about a young boy who one day recognizes that he has a problem. And that problem is illustrated by a black cloud. And the more that he tries to run away from this black cloud, uh, ignore it, hide from it, the larger it becomes. Uh, until one day when he faces this cloud and he recognizes and he says these things, my problem wasn't what I thought it was. I discovered it had something beautiful inside. My problem held an opportunity. And I would like to propose that colorectal cancer is similar. It's a huge problem. It's a common problem. Um, but therein also lies a great opportunity that I hope to highlight to you today. Um, and so as we go into the first part of the, the outline, I'd like to also illustrate how colorectal cancer impacts us all. So obviously not just um, the providers, not just the patients or those of you who have had um, and are surviving colorectal cancer, um, but this is family. This is friends. These are people in our church pews. These are people at our kids' activities who are all impacted by colorectal cancer. So we're all impacted one way or another. It is the leading cause of gastrointestinal death. It is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths. Um, the lifetime risk for anyone is approximately five times. 5% overall, and they're greater than a million people living with colorectal cancer. 
Now you can imagine how costly this is. Over 14 billion, with a B, is spent annually in colorectal cancer care continuum. That's that goes from the uh, prevention to survivorship, uh, and everything in between, including treatment. And unfortunately, the burden of colorectal cancer is not equally distributed. Let me draw your eyes to the left side, to the graph on the left side. And uh, what this is, is basically demonstrating cancer death rates in the United States on the x-axis. So at the bottom, you can see the year of death. And on the y-axis, so on the side, uh, you see the rate per 100,000 population, again, of cancer deaths. What you will notice from 1990 to 2014, the death rate has been declining. Good news, right? But you will also recognize that the different colored lines um, are separated by some space. And those different colored lines represent different races. So the red is non-Hispanic black, the blue is non-Hispanic white, the purple is um, American Indian and Alaskan Native, the orange is Hispanic, and the green is Asian and Pacific Islander. So you can see, albeit we have made progress in decreasing mortality or death rate from colorectal cancer, there are significant disparities based on race and ethnicity. If you then look on the rightmost panel, so the graph of the United States, so the illustration of the United States, uh, the colors represent different uh, um, stages, particularly as it pertains to death per 100,000 population, with red being bad and blue being better or good. And you can see that there are certain regions that have more red than others, particularly where I am in Ohio, you can see um, that there is some red, it kind of particularly on the southern border, and Ohio is actually one of the states um, within regions that have the highest death rates in the nation. So not only are there um, disparities based on race and ethnicity, we see disparities also based on geography. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as well. Additionally, there are disparities based on insurance status. So one marker of socioeconomic status. Um, the, at the bottom on the x-axis, you see survival time in months. And on the y-axis is adjusted survival. And what this can be a little complicated, but what I want you to draw your attention to is the fact that at I, any stage, that stage of cancer, so in this case, this illustration demonstrates stage one and stage two cancers. Those who are uninsured or on Medicaid have a worse survival than those who are privately insured. So those who are, let's say, for example, those who are stage one for uninsured and uninsured or on Medicaid have a worse prognosis than people who are stage two colorectal cancer and are privately insured. So one marker of socioeconomic status. And these are all, you know, as I show you these things, these are all part of what we call social determinants of health. So a lot of our health is, is happens outside of the walls of the clinic or in the hospital, but there are other factors, whether it's where we grew up, where we spend our time, how many playgrounds were available in the, in the area in which we lived, do we have employment, can we work, do we have insurance, all these things kind of factor in. So if we look at this next chart, you'll see on the um, x-axis years of education going in kind of tertiles from less than 12 years to 13 and 15 years, to greater than 16 years. On the y-axis, you see deaths per 100,000 persons. So again, similar to what we've looked at in the last two graphs. And at the top, you can see that it's divided by race and ethnicity with non-Hispanic white on the left, in the middle non-Hispanic black, and on the right, Hispanic. What you can see is almost a dose-dependent relationship, meaning as the number of years increase for education, the um, likelihood of survival improves or the number of deaths decreases another way of saying it. you can see the number of deaths decreasing so education again being a marker one of those social determinants of health um, that impact disparities in colon cancer one thing i'd also like to draw your attention to we see and this is a repeated pattern you'll see in some of these things and you noticed it in the first line graph that i showed you particularly as it pertains to race that african americans tend to have the poorest uh, outcomes if you look at an African-American such as myself, who's had greater than 16 years of education and deaths per 100,000 persons, that is worse, the number of deaths is worse than a Hispanic individual who has l had less than 12 years of education. So again, keep all of these things in mind as we go throughout this presentation. Now, 
Not only are their outcomes not equally distributed based on race, ethnicity, geography, we talked about education, socioeconomic status, um, but also the risks are not equally distributed. Look at this first, first one. This first um, uh, depiction demonstrates um, the number of tobacco farms, okay, in the United States. And really it's uh, the blue tells you where there's the most, so greater than 700, and the yellow is where it's the least. Okay, so keep, keep this in your mind as I go, go along. You'll notice in these same areas, the percent of smokers is higher, with red being bad and white being much better, okay? Again, looking at the same area. So if you look at this, this next graph on your left shows the state cigarette tax, okay? So um, the light beige is where there's the lowest tax, and the dark blue is where the highest tax. So you'll see overlap from the first graph where I showed you where the number of tobacco farms are to the second graph that's now on the right, which is percent smokers, to now on the left again, where we see the tax in those areas where there's more farms, more smokers, they have lower taxes. Again, potentially something encouraging more smoking. If we look on the rightmost graph, again, overlapping with all the other graphs is tobacco-related cancers. No surprise here. I've just been connecting the dots for you as we are going along. Now, let's look at obesity. Again, another risk factor for colorectal cancer. Um, percent obese adults, if you look uh, kind of uh, red, again, red is bad. That's where 30 to close to 35% of individuals in this population are obese. Again, look at this on the right. You can see that same kind of area is where people don't have cars or a small proportion of people have cars and no access to a supermarket within a mile. Again, promoting obesity. If we look at America's most walkable cities, are those places included? No. So the places that we just highlighted as having higher obesity, lack of car, no supermarket within a mile, they're also not walkable areas. And not surprisingly, these are the same areas where the incidence rates for colorectal cancer is higher, okay? Again, all I'm doing is connecting the dots for you here. Now, so we've kind of outlined some of the disparities. We've seen that there has been a decline in colorectal cancer death rates over time, uh, but there's a lot of work that still can be done. And we know that it's largely prevented or the impact that we've seen as far as the decline in cancer mortality rate has largely been due to both screening and diet and lifestyle, so adjusting risk factors. A very small proportion of that decline in death rate has been due to treatment. So there's a lot of things that we can modify, if whether it be lifestyle factors, diet factors, or even getting screened that it can impact uh, the risk of death. And again, there are things that we can't modify. We can't modify our age, right? We can't modify who our parents were, our grandparents were, but these other things we can modify. So I'd like to review some evidence-based uh, prevention strategies. Number one, smoking. If you are smoking, please stop. I know it's easier said than done. Trust me, I see a ton of patients who have been battling smoking for a very long time. And I know it is not easy to quit, especially, especially if you have a family member or friend with whom you live and they're smoking too. Um, but I can't tell you the impact that this will have on your life. Even, even amongst those who have lung cancer, stopping smoking has an impact on their survival and quality of life. So, Look, stop smoking. Not only can this predispose you to getting uh, colon cancer and lung cancer, but a plethora of other cancers. Eat healthy. There's one thing that's strongly advocated and strongly supported by evidence. It's the impact of a healthy diet, particularly fiber. Fiber being one thing that you can do to modify your diet. Uh, one way, getting more fruits and vegetables is one way to get fiber. You can also take supplementary fiber. You can also supplement different things in your diet. Uh, that have more fiber, for example, supplementing white bread for wheat bread is one example, or using brown rice instead of white rice. So finding ways to get more fiber, more fruits and vegetables in your diet can prevent colon cancer. Drinking in moderation. Well, you know, I ask a patient, hey, how often are you drinking or what are you drinking? Uh, well, I have, uh, you know, one drink uh, a day and well, how much is that? Oh, a 40 ounce or a fifth of, of vodka. Well, you know, let me put this into perspective as to what drinking moderation is. So for uh, men, it's two drinks a day at most. And for women, it's one drink a day. And 
the equivalent of one drink is 1.5 ounces of spirits or five ounces of wine or 12 ounces of uh, beer. Another important factor is obesity. I talked about that in one of the earlier slides, but obesity is a risk factor for colorectal cancer. So trying to maintain or achieve a healthy weight is one way in which you can reduce your risk for colorectal cancer. And exercise. I mean, not only is this advocated by the American Heart Association, um, but this is uh, advocated by cancer, cancer societies as well as a means to prevent cancer. So exercising at least 30 minutes a day, at least five days out of the week is pivotal uh, in lowering your risk for colorectal cancer. And as I'll describe a little bit further, screening is important. I showed you a pie chart in one of the earlier slides uh, that suggested the impact of screening on decline in death rates. And we know that screening does save lives. Now, what does screening mean? I kind of use that just assuming that you may know, but I understand that many people might not know what screening means. And so screening is test, testing of individuals who are asymptomatic, meaning they don't have symptoms, so they're not having rectal bleeding, they're not having severe abdominal pain, they've not had any unintentional weight loss, they're not necessarily anemic, um, but at risk for the disease. And the purpose of screening is to prevent, interrupt, or delay the development of advanced disease. Now, why does it matter when you start screening? Well, because we can do just what it said. We can prevent, we can delay or interrupt development of disease. Now, I'm showing you pictures from a patient that I actually uh, did a colonoscopy on. And you can see this patient on the left, you can see had normal mucosa, uh, normal lining of the colon. You can also see I found an adenomous or precancerous polyp in this patient, but you can also see cancer there. And, um, you know, you can see all of this in one person. You can see this in multiple people or different things in different uh, people. Uh, but this is why uh, cancer screening is so important, because I would much rather catch a polyp, also, you know, called an adenoma, um, in this case, a precancerous polyp, uh, than to catch a cancer. And, and that's what screening can do. Now, Timing matters for other reasons as well. We know that the risk of cancer increases with age, with the highest incidence of cancers being above age 60. And so that's why um, when we talk about screening and when your doctor or your healthcare provider recommends it, they usually recommend it starting at age 50. However, we have seen a shift for African Americans. African Americans tend to present younger uh, than Caucasians with colorectal cancer. Uh, there's also less time from age 50 to the average age of colorectal cancer diagnosis, so a sh shortening of that window to get screened. And when we look at the stage of distribution, meaning cancer has different stages, local, regional, distant, distant being metastasized, metastasized meaning the cancer has spread from its origin in the colon to other organs, such as the liver or the lung or the brain, for example. And if you look at the topmost panel, so stage of distribution, you'll notice in red and in purple, those purple bars, that's red is non-Hispanic blacks and the purple is American Indian Alaskan natives, tend to have more percent of patients having uh, distant disease or metastatic where it's spread to other areas. And these same populations, no matter what stage it is, so even if it's local or regional and not metastatic, have worse survival. So again, it's so important that we consider timing and when we start screening. And for average risk individuals, uh, meaning the general population, we recommend starting at age 50. However, there have been recent guidelines by the United States Multi-Society Task Force that suggest that African Americans should start at age 45. This is important, and it's important African Americans talk with their providers, but also their insurers, because unfortunately not all insurers are covering uh, preventive screenings at age 45. So if you're in this window, age 45, to start screening your African American, I encourage you to talk to your insurer to see if your colorectal cancer screening will be covered at this age. Now, if you are not average risk, meaning you have had a relative 
who has been impacted, diagnosed with colorectal cancer, particularly a first degree relative who's less than age 60 or two first degree relatives who are greater than age 60 with either colorectal cancer or an advanced adenoma, polyp, um, they should start at age 40 or 10 years younger than the age of diagnosis, whichever one comes first. So for example, I know they can get a little complicated. For example, if you have a relative who was diagnosed at age 45, they would start at age 35, so 10 years younger than that, okay? We also know that choice matters. When you choose colorectal cancer screening test, you have multiple options. And we it's been demonstrated in research that when they're given options, so not just colonoscopy, but stool-based testing as well, the uptake increases. So you'll see in each of these graphs along the x-axis, the third bar represents when people had choice of, two, of the two tests as opposed to just one or the other. So we know that choice matters. But there, let me go into a little bit more detail on the types of tests um, that, that you should be offered when you talk with your provider about screening. I like to group them in cancer prevention tests and cancer detection tests. So the gold standard for uh, colorectal cancer screening is the colonoscopy. And it's because when you get a colonoscopy, you use a camera that can look throughout the entire colon, and if you identify polyps, you can remove them right during that exam. Now, colonoscopy is a test where you do have to take a bowel prep the day before, and sometimes the day of, and you're, you need to have a companion with you because you are given medicine to make you sedated during that procedure, so to make it more comfortable for you. Flexible sigmoidoscopy is also an option, but flexible sigmoidoscopy only looks at part of the colon, so it's basically like a half of a colonoscopy and it doesn't evaluate the entire colon. And there's also CT colonography, also called virtual colonoscopy. That's like a CT scan that looks for polyps. Now, similar to the colonoscopy, you also have to take a bowel prep, um, but you are not sedated for this procedure. And again, um, the one limitation to this is, even if you do identify a polyp, you can't remove it. You would then have to actually get a colonoscopy to remove that polyp. Then there are cancer detection tests. These are the stool-based tests. And there are multiple tests that are on the market. Um, one of the first ones that came on the market was the fecal occult blood test. And this is an annual test that basically looks for blood in the stool. A fecal immunochemical test is more sensitive and specific. It's still annual, but it's more sensitive and specific and doesn't require some of the dietary limitations that you have to have with a fecal occult blood test. And more recently, some of you have, may have seen commercials for this, is the FIT DNA test, or also called Cologar, that can be done every three years. All of these are home-based, stool-based tests. Uh, so that may make it more convenient for you. The thing to keep in mind, however, and I counsel patients and providers on this, is that it's important to know that these tests are best at detecting cancer, and in some cases, detecting advanced polyps, um, but if they are found to be abnormal, the next step is to get a colonoscopy. So that's very important. For patients who are considering refusing colonoscopy, they need to know that even if the, stu if the stool-based test is, is positive, abnormal, um, the next step is to get a colonoscopy. The other thing is that not all screening tests are created equal. When we look at the fecal occult blood test, we know that it has led to a reduction in cancer mortality by about 16, 15, 16 percent. And, uh, and some studies have demonstrated a 25% risk reduction uh, in colorectal cancer for those having at least one round. Sigmoidoscopy, so flexible sigmoidoscopy, which I previously described as almost like a half of a colonoscopy, has also had an impact on decreasing uh, deaths from colorectal cancer. Um, similarly, when combining the sigmoidoscopy with the fecal occult blood test, but Notice most of that improvement or in reduction in risk or a stronger correlation with the reduction in risk, stronger impact in reduction in risk has been demonstrated with the colonoscopy as compared to the other tests. Yet it's also important to keep in mind that no screening test is perfect. Um, these are subject to error, both human error and testing error. So um, when we talk about adenomas, again, polyps, um, polyp miss rate on average can reach up to 20%. And we also know that people who have colonoscopies that were deemed normal, so in between the time that they have that first normal colonoscopy and their next one, they're about 8%, up to 8% can notice 
uh, interval cancer, so development of colorectal cancer in between those two colonoscopies. So again, no test is perfect. Similarly, with flexible sigmoidoscopy, albeit it has demonstrated a reduction in, in incidence of cancer and death rate from cancer, um, unfortunately, um, it does miss those cancers that happen in the right side of the colon, again, because it's not reaching over there, and there's poor rates of follow-up to colonoscopy. And again, I mentioned some of the limitations of the stool-based testing. Again, it's good at detecting cancer uh, and advanced precancerous lesions. Um, the challenge is that you can't identify the small polyps um, or precancerous polyps, small adenomas that aren't, aren't advanced. And there is um, there are differences in each of the tests with um, the FIT DNA test or the Cologuard stool DNA test uh, being one of the better tests on the market for stool-based testing. Now I'd like to highlight some best practices for improving colorectal cancer prevention and outcomes um, in the community, in your state, in your city, um, and even some things that may be able to be adapted in your workplace. And what's important about this is that we approach this in a way that um, looks particularly at equity. So it's not necessarily equality, giving everybody the same tools, but it's looking who needs what and targeting that so that everyone has an equal opportunity for health. And particularly as we approach this from a population health level, it's important that we do so um, from a multi-level framework. So looking at from the individual to what's happening around the nation in regards to health policy that can impact this. Engaging our community, utilizing patient navigators, and removing financial barriers. Delaware has done this very successfully. They had um, buy-in from their governor, legislature, healthcare providers, communities, and they put dollars behind it. It was funded, um, the Delaware C Cancer Consortium was funded in 2003 and had three areas of focus. So colorectal cancer screening, screening uh, payment for under and uninsured individuals and eliminating disparities amongst African Americans. And you'll recall the data that I highlighted earlier about African Americans. It was a statewide initiative. They had screening navigators. Uh, they had money to pay for the screening. They engaged and recruited underserved populations and provided over 10,000 navigations and 5,000 screenings through 2011. And it's important, again, to emphasize that this was universal screening. They covered both navigation and covered costs of their procedures. And so let's look at the data. When we look at the percentage of adults in the green line, you'll see Caucasians. In the blue line, you'll see African Americans. So the percent of those who had colorectal cancer screening, you'll see from 2002 to 2010, they eliminated that screening disparity. So both African Americans and Caucasians were on equal footing when it comes to colorectal cancer screening. When we look at stage by diagnosis, we talked about this earlier. You prefer to have more local stage being diagnosed than distant. Distant is when it has metastasized to other organs. And you'll see from 2001 on the left to 2009 on the right, you'll see a significant shift to more cancer being diagnosed locally or regionally as opposed to distant. And so earlier stage of diagnosis, a critical change. When we look at incidence rates, the rate per 100,000 people of new diagnosis of colorectal cancer, black line is all races, the pink line is African Americans, the green line is Caucasians you'll see that they closed that gap from 1999 to the 2000, 2001 area to 2009. And we will look at mortality along the same lines. You'll see that the gap was significantly reduced during that time period. Again, putting dollars behind it, putting investment of time, resources, and money. Reduce cancer mortality. Now, I want to talk to you about some of the things that we've done at my institution, at The Ohio State University, at the Comprehensive Cancer Center, the James Cancer Hospital, and the Wexner Medical Center. We call our program the PACE program, or the Provider and Community Engagement Program for Health Equity and Colorectal Cancer Prevention. And we approach this by establishing meaningful partnerships, assuming mutual responsibility, and shared decision-making amongst patients and providers. We started by going out into the community and assessing, what do you need? How can we be of best assistance to you? As opposed to going in and saying, hey, here are our white coats, we're from the ivory tower, this is what needs to be done. No, we got community input on what was needed and how we could approach this. And so we have an inflatable colon. This is a 
large 10 foot high and about 20 foot long inflatable cola in which we give people tours. We have multiple events throughout the year where we go to churches, we go to health fairs, and we give people tours walking through this inflatable colon, not only talking about colon health, but talking about colon cancer prevention and screening. And we've demonstrated that this not only increases their knowledge about colon cancer and colon cancer prevention, but also increases their willingness to discuss it with others, and more importantly, their intention to then be screened for colon cancer. We've had Walk with the Doc grocery store tours, where we have a registered dietitian that we work with at a local grocery store chain, and a doctor to walk patients, walk community members through the grocery store to talk about how to eat healthy on a budget, how to prepare food to optimize this nutritional value, and more recently, we've had a even a Facebook Live series of this, so people don't have to come out of the comforts of their home or their workplace, they can actually watch this live on Facebook. And this video is available on our on the OSU uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center and the James Cancer Hospital Facebook page. Um, we've also in, um, worked with one of our chefs, Chef Jim Warner, to provide cooking demonstrations and tastings in the community. Again, talking about how to prepare food, what food to prepare to stay healthy, and again, on a budget. Um, we've worked with the YMCA in the past to provide not only lectures, but also um, uh, uh, for example, in this case, you're seeing a picture of a line dancing class, so exercise classes, because we know exercise is a part of colorectal cancer prevention. And in the middle, in the white shirt and yellow tie, there's actually my boss in there dancing too, so that's kind of funny. Um, um, we've had a, and we have an annual cancer disparities conference. This is a conference that um, we open up to anyone, um, and it's something that's attracted people from all over Ohio and people beyond Ohio. Uh, we have this in March every year. Uh, the audience typically includes healthcare providers, uh, community organization leadership, researchers, um, and we try to have as many stakeholders in the room as possible, but to disseminate information on best practices in cancer prevention, treatment, survivorship um, and that we know of. And this goes beyond colon cancer, but this extends to other cancers um, as well. And so this has been a very successful initiative we've had now for the past uh, uh, four years. Uh, we have a live 10 TV uh, phone bank where we have our providers at the TV station answering calls from people in the community about colon cancer, about colon cancer prevention. Uh, last year when we had this initiative we reached 55,000 households by the t uh, by the programming ahead, over 130 calls that we answered in an hour and a half uh, and so this has been something that's been very successful. We're in our churches talking about the same topics. Uh, we have screening Saturdays. These are Saturdays during the month of March that are tailored to those who are uninsured and underinsured. We have a fantastic, incredible group of uh, patient navigators, financial counseling personnel, staff, nurses, uh, physicians who volunteer their time, who help people to get insured if they don't have insurance, or to enroll in a patient assistance program to get necessary screening, and if found to have a cancer, to ultimately get treatment. And we have advocates who help us to do the same. So on the left, you'll see uh, for, uh, a two-time cancer survivor talking with a gentleman who's about to get his first colonoscopy. And so that was kind of brings us full circle. We also know that colorectal cancer prevention doesn't start when someone comes into our endoscopy suite for their first uh, colonoscopy, but it starts far beyond that with behaviors, with habits, um, with diet and lifestyle. And so we've worked with um, schools and on the left, you'll see uh, part of um, the Health Science Academies, which is a network of seven schools from elementary to high school that we work with um, in helping their curriculum, particularly around health sciences. And I'm, I'll tell you, I've never seen white coats that small until I started working with these kids. Uh, but those are some elementary school kids in white coats. And we talk again about um, cancer prevention amongst many other topics. In the middle, you'll see a middle school student who wrote a letter to our senator about a barrier to colorectal cancer screening. So again, we have students advocating to alleviate bar barriers to colorectal cancer screening. On the right, um, um, I'm pictured there with some staff and doctor and nurses um, from Hawaii, actually. I went to Hawaii because they were trying to adapt some of the things that we're doing um, to some of the disparities that they're experiencing in Hawaii. Um, particularly amongst uh, some of their native Hawaiian populations there. And if you haven't uh, recognized it yet, this is all a team effort. I mean, I have a fantastic staff. I even have nurses who have sponsored bake sales, donut and coffee sales, chili cook-offs, uh, to raise money to assist with some of the things that we do, such as the conferences, such as some of the outreach that we do. And people are heavily invested. So for me, it's been really a pleasure to lead uh, this group. And finally, I'd like to leave you with a story. Again, I start off with one story, what do you do with the problem? I'm going to leave you with a second. Um, this is 
uh, one of our favorite stories, and I say our this time as opposed to mine because my kids enjoy this book too. But this tells a story of a, of a fish by the name of Swimmy. Swimmy, you can see him pictured there in the middle of the blackfish. And uh, Swimmy, unfortunately, um, he and his family and his friends were terrorized by this large kind of uh, fish that came and one day swallowed up almost everyone he knew. And Swimmy was the only one to escape. So again, big problem, big fish swallowing up everything. And Swimmy, after all his friends and family were gone, he kept traveling. He was swimming around trying to find some other fish to travel with. Um, um, he was trying to find a home. And one day he did find a school of fish that was similar to his family, similar to his prior uh, uh, friends. And he said, look guys, I've seen this shark in the water. I've seen this fish in the water before that's been terrorizing people. I have a plan. This is how we're gonna attack this program, uh, this problem, excuse me, but we have to work together. And so he assembled all the fish and together they made an even bigger fish, as you can see there with, with Swimmy at the eye of that bigger fish and they chased that problem away. Together we can beat colorectal cancer. It takes all of us putting our heads together, our brains together, time together, resources together, uh, but we can beat colorectal cancer. Thank you very much for allowing me to share some time with you today. I hope that you learned something um, and I am more than happy to, to, to um, answer questions you may have. So thank you, Dr. Gray, um, very much for a fabulous presentation. <clears throat> this is Sharon Steingast, and I'm going to moderate the question and answer period. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, and before we start the question and answer period, I just want to make sure that people are aware that we have presented Dr. Gray's slides um, under the handout section of the GoToWebinar uh, area that you can download those and refer to them in the future. So we actually have had some great questions that have come in, Dr. Gray. And the first question is, um, do you have some suggestions um, for other screening approaches for somebody who cannot tolerate um, a colonoscopy or um, a flexible sigmoidoscopy? Yes. Um, so first, um, it would, it's very important that in this situation you talk with your provider, so your primary care provider, and if you don't feel satisfied with the answer that you were provided by your primary care provider in regards to this, consider a referral to a gastroenterologist. These are the individuals such as myself who perform those procedures and who routinely recommend different types of uh, colorectal cancer screening. The thing to keep in mind, and the reason I say that is because I, I'm not sure why uh, this individual particularly cannot tolerate it. It could be for multiple reasons. One reason could be because of other health conditions. So sometimes people have disease and conditions that they wouldn't be stable enough to undergo a, um, um, a, a colonoscopy, for example, or a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Or they, it may have been because they might have found it uncomfortable in the past, et cetera. So that's why I say it's so important to talk to your provider. Now, the other tests uh, that I mentioned, so both the CT colonography as well as the stool tests are options. However, again, I ex exercise caution there because um, if it, they are found to be positive in some way, whether it's detecting a polyp or an abnormal stool test, the next step would be the colonoscopy. So it's important in your case or the individual's case who said they can't tolerate it to know whether or not they should actually pursue colorectal cancer screening because what are you going to do with the information of a positive test such as a CT colonography or a stool-based test if you can't act upon that information with the colonoscopy, for example? Okay, thank you. And uh, just as a follow-up maybe to that question is, you know, what I think prevents a lot of people from um, doing a colonoscopy or a flex flexible sigmoidoscopy is sometimes it's the test, but a lot of times it's the prep um, mm -hmm. and getting ready for that test. And you mentioned that briefly. Can you describe um, options for preparation um, and how to make that easier or more toler palatable, I guess? Sure. So, um 
you know, it used to be that people would only have one prep as an option. And uh, one of the older preps we have, well, actually, there there were multiple back in the day. Um, um, one of the uh, ones that people, I guess, cringe the most at is the uh, Go Lightly prep, which is a four liter bowel prep. Um, now, albeit evidence has demonstrated that to be one of the superior preps for cleaning your colon. And we actually still use that. But what we've done is, is we recommend what's called a split bowel prep, which means you'll take half of that the evening prior to your procedure and the other half of that the morning of your procedure. And so that kind of helps with some of that um, uh, concern about trying to drink four liters kind of all at once in one evening. Um, but there are other smaller volume preps as well. And I, I know I may be getting a little redundant, but it's so important that you talk about the options with your provider because some of the smaller volume preps um, can have adverse effects. The Go Lightly has the advantage of being kind of electrolyte neutral, meaning we don't have to worry about fluid shifts. So even in someone who has heart disease, who has heart failure, who has kidney disease, who's on dialysis, um, we don't have to worry about fluid shifts with Go Lightly. Whereas with some of the other um, smaller volume preps, you have to be mindful because it can exacerbate kidney disease. Um, and so you have to talk with your providers about some of the newer um, uh, products on the line. There And there's a ton of them. Um, some of the newer ones, pre-popic, soup prep, movie prep, these are all smaller volume preps, but it's important that you talk with your doctor about them. Now, some people have also used, for example, over-the-counter uh, magnesium citrate and preps. Again, exercise caution, um, particularly those of you who have had uh, problems with kidney disease. Um, I encourage everyone to talk to their provider about the type of prep they're going to use. Okay. And then another question, there's kind of a group of questions that have come in about, again, potentially understanding um, if everybody's risk is the same. And mm -hmm. certainly um, there are some folks who have attended today's session that have a family member that has mm -hmm. a history of mm -hmm. colon cancer. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned genetics briefly during your talk. Can you talk about family history and how that may potentially change when should I start myself to get um, screened for colorectal cancer? Certainly. For those of you who have a family history of colon, col colon or rectal cancer, we kind of combine those together and say colorectal cancer, um, it's important that you know, number one, um, who, who that family member was. So was it a first degree relative, mother, father, brother, sister, or is it a second degree relative? That impacts your risk. The other thing that impacts your risk is the age at which they were diagnosed. So we consider the highest risk as it pertains to family history, those who have a family history of a first degree relative who is diagnosed less than age 60. That's where the highest risk is going to be. Additionally, if you've had a first degree relative or more than one first degree relative, who has been diagnosed with an advanced polyp or colorectal cancer, again, less than age 60, that's where the highest risk as it pertains to family history um, um, is. And then for, for those of you who fall within that, it's important that you start your screening 10 years younger than the, either at age 40 or 10 years younger than the age at which that individual, that first degree relative was diagnosed. So I gave the example earlier. So for example, let's say you had a family member who was diagnosed at age 45. That means that you would start at age 35, not age 40, but 10 years younger starts first or to occur first. So starting at age 35 with your screening. And again, I encourage you to talk with your provider about your family history so that they can document it. So that if there's a question that comes up from your insurance company at, hey, why is this person getting a colonoscopy at this age? They have justified it. They have documented that in your in your chart uh, that you have a family history of a first degree relative, and it's justified for you to have this colonoscopy as a preventative screening measure. Great, thank you. And I think one of the other things that you also touched about um, in your presentation is um, not only just to talk to your primary care provider about when you should be screened, but then also if you're having barriers to getting your screening scheduled, potentially be because of insurance or lack mm -hmm. of insurance, that um, patients should ask about, are there other folks to help them, such as a navigator, a financial counselor, to get patients 
um, access to resources. Is there anything else you would like to add to that no, commentary? Absolutely. absolutely. That was a great summary. And yes, um, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, individual providers won't necessarily know the answers to those questions. Uh, but ask them if they can refer you or or recommend someone that they know to talk to, depending on where you live, what medical center you go to, who your doctor is. They may know within their network who is a good connection to talk about resources for those who are uninsured, underinsured, um, and, and about other barriers, whether the barrier be insurance, uh, whether the barrier be transportation. Um, talk, I encourage you to talk with uh, people in that network to try to get resources that are tailored to you. Okay, great, great. Well, we are just a little after 12 noon, and um, I'm going to go ahead and close out this webinar. There are a few other um, very specific questions that have been answered or asked. Um, we will take those list of very specific questions and get them answered and try to get um, those communicated out to folks that have participated on the webinar. Again, Dr. Gray, uh, many, many thanks for your great presentation today. Um, thank you for all of you who have participated in this Cancer Bridge seminar. Um, and please look forward to our next seminar, which um, will be our webinar, which will be um, in May. Um, and we will communicate out the date, time, and the topic via flyer and emails throughout your organization. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and um, keep dry. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Dr. Gray. Thank you. Bye-bye.